really excited that you've all joined us today for the webinar on a deep dive into the art of neighboring. My name is Heather Keen, and it's my pleasure to introduce today's webinar on behalf of Tamarack and the city's deepening community team. Before we get started on this amazing conversation, we just wanted to get you all settled. Over to you, Connor. Thanks, Heather, and welcome everyone. I'd like to uh, just quickly kind of start with the land acknowledgement. So we begin this event by acknowledging that we are meeting on Indigenous lands. And for those of us who are settlers, we are grateful for the opportunity to meet. And we thank all the generations of Indigenous peoples who have taken care of this land. This recognition of the contributions and historic importance of Indigenous peoples must be clearly and overtly connected to our collective commitment to make the promise and the challenge of truth and reconciliation a reality in our communities. Um, I'm joining from Tech Toronto, colonially known as Toronto. This land is the traditional territory of the Mississaugas of the Credit, the Anishinaabe, the Chippewa, the Haudenosaunee, and the Wendat peoples. By acknowledging these lands and their original stewards, I'm trying to position myself, a white settler, within the social, historical, and political contexts embedded within the lands known as Canada, as well as commemorating Indigenous peoples' principal kinship to the land. So please, let us know in the chat box who you are, what company you're with, what organization you're with, and uh, what lands you're joining from. We'd love to hear from you. And then just to give everyone an idea of kind of who's in the room today. Uh, so we have uh, quite an international audience this afternoon. Uh, we have all Canadian provinces represented as well as several uh, states, including California, Colorado, Hawaii, and North Carolina. Uh, as well across the pond, we have uh, learners from Austria, Ireland, and the UK, and then even further, we have uh, learners from Australia, New Zealand, and the United K and Singapore. Uh, and then just to quickly kind of give everyone an idea of the different sectors in the room, we have uh, learners from academic sectors, those from foundations, municipalities, both provincial, state, and federal governments. We have those from healthcare, public health, and as well as faith-based groups. So once again, thank you everyone for joining us for this call, you know, wherever you are in this world, this morning, this afternoon, this evening, we really appreciate you joining us this afternoon. So Heather, I'm gonna pass it back to you. Thank you so much, Connor. So I'd like to start with um, thinking about the past two years. Uh, and what we really learned is that knowing your neighbor is so important for our communities. Um, and that I truly believe is how we made it through the pandemic. Now that we're looking to the future and we're rethinking how we can make communities essential, we need to focus on neighboring. What does it mean to be a good neighbor? How can we develop deeper relationships with those who live nearby? And understand that there are different levels of relationship. I'm really excited that you have all joined us today. We are going to shake things up a little bit on this webinar and it's going to be more of a fireside chat with you all. We believe that you are all experts uh, in this topic. We are all neighbors. We know somebody who lives near us, beside us, above us, below us. And so we are going to hopefully engage you in the chat box. Um, we'd love to hear from you. Um, as Deanna asks Dave questions, please feel free to answer them too. Um, so on that note, I would really like to introduce Deanna Butts, who is the Community Development Officer uh, for the Town of Stony Plain Community and Social Development Department. Whew, that's a long title. Um, and uh, Deanna is a long-term employee with the town and she has experience as a program coordinator for uh, older adults managing a home support program and community development focus that includes building community along the way. Uh, Deanna and I have worked together for a couple of years now and she is doing fantastic work in, uh, uh, in Stony Plain. And if you don't know where that is, it's just outside of Edmonton. Um, and her neighboring city of um, Spruce Grove. So uh, over to you, Deanna. Thanks so much, Heather. Uh, you know, it is really, truly exciting to be here. Um, I just want to give a bit of a background uh, before we start on, you know, kind of how and why, um, you know, Heather and I worked on this webinar um, to bring it out to everyone. Uh, so for us at the town of Stony Plain, um, we've been working on strengthening neighborhoods and ending social isolation for several years now. Um, and so we've been exploring the concept of neighbors connecting neighbors. And so we started out, um, you know, as a municipality at kind of the more formal level. 
Um, you know, we came out with guides and resources. Um, but as we've continued on through this journey, it's becoming more and more clear that engagement uh, related to neighborhood connectivity really needs to happen at multiple levels. So we, um, you know, and in that, sorry, that be, um, that starts with the community first. Um, we know that, but I think we really have learned and seen that we need to practice that. Um, so we needed to shift on how we were doing things and, and as a municipality think of doing with residents, not for residents. And so often, um, you know, we can see that municipalities are called on to be the leader and that residents really do or rely on municipality to do for. Um, so it was during one of our community engagement sessions here in Stony Plain that one of our active community leaders um, suggested this book, The Art of Neighboring. Um, so thank you, Linda, if you're on the call, thank you uh, for spurring this uh, conversation and, and get, you know, having our community go through the book. Um, so as I read the book, I was just continually inspired on so many levels. And I, I really wanted to kind of look at this idea that munis municipalities can't do it all. And that really residents are a part of the solution. Um, so if we could figure out how a community of great neighbors um, could assist with this, I think that we really could reduce, um, drastically reduce social problems. So one line that stood out for me was that relationships are far more effective than programs. That neighboring relationships matter. And really that this is a natural process. We don't need a manual and guides to be a kind person and a good neighbor. So again, um, we've kind of come to learn that we want to encourage residents uh, to be vulnerable and trusting, and th this will help reduce uh, that perceived fear around neighboring. Uh, we have come to recognize that um, as a municipality, that the residents have the gifts and the skills and that the mun municipality really can assist in just creating that safe space so that the residents feel like they have the capacity to share those gifts. We can see that neighboring is more than hosting a block party, although hosting a, a block party is a fun and easy way to get to know your neighbors. Um, and again, this book really works to dispel myths and fears around the concepts of neighboring. And we'll, allow, we'll get into that with Dave in a little bit here. I'll just quickly share an example um, that we kind of experienced um, in Stony Plain. Uh, we've had, we had the adopt a driveway snow removal program for many years. Um, the town had been matching residents with, uh, with, with volunteers to help with snow removal in the winter season. So as the program uh, you know, was evaluated, it can be seen that it was really labor intensive to manage this program. Um, and also there was other resources in the region to assist with snow removal. Um, there is financial programs available to help with the cost of snow removal. So we delicately retired the program. And so I was prepared to hear you know, a lot of pushback from the residents as I explained that the program was no longer available for the next winter season. Um, but you know what, I was, I was pleasantly surprised. Um, the majority of the residents' um, reactions were positive. They had already built relationships with their, their volunteers, and they really didn't need the municipality's support any further. Um, so that was really interesting and kind of a key learning. Um, you know, we thought as a municipality, we had to keep doing four and keep providing this service. Um, but really, the residents had kind of solved their own problems, made their own connections, and um, we were able to then pull back and not um, offer that program anymore. Uh, so that's a little bit about why we um, really started to look at this, this neighboring concept. Um, I wanted to bring Dave out and have a chat. Uh, so again, I'm really excited and honored to be here today. Um, I just think by having these conversations, we're building a vibrant network of communities um, that are committed to strengthening neighborhoods and fostering this community change um, through com resident led action. As friendships grow, so do safe and caring communities. So let's talk to Dave now about the art of neighboring and how we're building genuine relationships right outside our doors. So thanks, Dave. Thanks for joining us today. It's um, good to be here, Deanna. Yeah, let's let's start with like, why did you write this book? Where did this come from? <laughs> yeah, well, it was definitely not intentional. I was at that time I was serving. This was probably back in. 2009, 2010, I was serving as a pastor at a local congregation um, here in the Denver metro area. And a group of us had come together to think about it, how would we best serve our city? And we started to just kind of dream if we could mobilize people in these diverse faith communities um, and to 
to put them out into our community and to think about what are the broken areas of our city and how best could we have an impact. We were, we were dreaming about all these different things. And we just realized that as faith leaders, we didn't know our community very well. And we couldn't answer the question, like, what's the smartest thing we could do if we were going to come together collectively? And so we started to have community conversations. We'd bring in the police chief or the city manager. And back in 2010, we brought in our mayor. And those questions were always just uh, along, those times were just along the lines of asking civic leaders, um, where do you feel stuck? What do you see, if you could wave a magic wand in our community and get us to rally around one thing, what should we do? And so we were sitting in the room with our mayor and asking all of those questions. And, and he came prepared with this long list of like things that, that he would love to see us go after. And it was all the stuff that you'd probably think. It was, you know, um, elderly uh, people who were isolated, uh, single moms living below the poverty line, uh, financial debt, all of these different things. And he got to the end of this list and he read them all off. And then he just kind of in passing just said, you know, if you guys wanted to have the biggest impact in our city, you should start some kind of a neighboring movement. And, and then he just kind of went on. He's going to talk about something else. And we, were, we said, hey, go talk about that more. And as he started to share his heart mm -hmm. for the power, the impact of neighboring, we were in, intrigued and convicted at the same time. Uh, he, had, mm -hmm. he had no idea that he was sitting there telling a bunch of, of faith leaders, all who believe in faith traditions, that uh, the idea of loving your neighbor is at the center of a lot of uh, almost, you know, every major faith uh, has this element around that. And he just started to share really practical ways that n literal neighboring makes a big difference in his world. And, you know, he talked about he talked about this program that they were getting ready to raise money for that was going to address elderly, isolated, uh, you know, for lack of a better word, shut ins. And he said, you know, we're going to raise all this money. We're going to start this program. But what we know is that that person lives in an apartment complex or in a neighborhood where they're known by their actual neighbors. They don't need their programs. And he said this beautiful line. He said, what we're learning at the city is that relationships always trump programs. Mm -hmm. And as he said that, our whole it was, it was just kind of like this, <laughs> you know, this moment of aha came over our room. And we just started to think and to dream about what would it be like for us in the faith community to, to launch a neighboring movement and to just do really simple things that connect people with the people who live, you know, 10, 20, 30 feet right outside their front door. Um, and so we ended up doing that. We had about 26 different faith communities come together and begin to just kind of roll this out to their people of really simple things, you know, just learning, you know, learning, retaining and using the names of their neighbors, throwing good block parties, uh, looking for ways to just have their eyes open for what are the assets and the deficits in their neighborhoods mm -hmm. and thinking about ways to address those. Wow. So really, um, kind of what I've taken away is, is this isn't about religion, right? Um, no, no not, a, not at all. <laughs> I mean, it, it was a bunch of, it was a bunch of people who kind of live in that sector, but the partnership for us was getting faith and government and business mm -hmm. leaders together to think about how do we how do we just start a neighboring movement without any agenda or strings attached? How do we just kind of build the relational connective tissue in our city? Let's talk about that a little bit because I have to say, like I started out, um, you know, like apprehensive, like, well, how does municipal work with with churches? Um, so can you talk a little bit more about that and why? Yeah, why I mean, are most so scared to deal with churches. That's a great question. Why are most municipal leaders <laughs> scared to deal with churches? Because there's yep. a lot of weird churches. I mean, there's a lot <laughs> like that's <laughs> that's why. <laughs> um, I think there's a, a there's a lot of people in my face stream and other face stream um, that have come into efforts and initiatives working alongside of civic leaders. And a lot of times it's gone weird because there's been hidden agendas that have been involved. Yeah. And so I think one of the things that we learned and we came to our civic leaders just saying, we want to learn about our community and we want to figure out ways to mobilize people in, you know, for the common good without trying to come in and, and think, hey, this is an opportunity to convince people to believe the exact same way that I do. And I think that's the, the key to success for faith and government partnerships is just to 
start with a foundation of just learning and saying like, you know, I like to just ask civ civic leaders, municipal leaders that I'm working with, hey, what, what weird experiences have you had with the faith community in the past? And just to get all of that out on the table and, and to just, I think that's really, really important. Um, and those conversations early on might lead you to thinking, hey, this isn't, this isn't the right thing for us at this time. Um, but oftentimes I think just laying a, fa a, a foundation is really, really helpful. And I just, I encourage faith leaders to come in and uh, to not overpromise, you know, to come in and, and just think, what are the simple things that we can do? And just to be really honest about their motives. And I think when both sides put that on the table, it's, it, sets, uh, it sets the tone in a really good way. Yeah, um, I had, oh, see, I, I'm listening and I need to be thinking at the same time. So I'm challenged here. <laughs> um, the municipality piece. Oh, could you talk a little bit about, because um, you were more than just one faith organization at the table, right? Like there was multiple faith-based organizations. Yeah, there was about. And so you guys had to figure out how to work together even in that realm, right? Yes, that's, yeah. a, that's exactly right. And I think, I think faith communities tend to focus on the 5% that they disagree on instead of the 95% <laughs> that they agree on. And so that was a really helpful, uh, you know, just acknowledging that was really helpful to kind of build for us a sandbox in which we could all play in and that we weren't trying to, to say, hey, this is about growing our own organization or growing our own saying, this is about our city and our community. Mm -hmm. And if you have a heart for our community to thrive, and to be a part of identifying, and I know this is like the opposite of asset-based community development, but a lot of our stuff was looking at civic leaders and saying, where, you know, where do you feel stuck? If you were gonna mobilize us into one thing, what would it be? Um, and so having that, and that, you know, service and serving the city became the, okay, you know, there's, yeah. have you ever heard of, of centered set and bounded set kind of frame, mental frameworks for, for doing this work, you know, uh, bounded set is everybody's got to think along these lines and you kind of build this in and out type mentality and centered set is just if you have a heart for this one thing if you have a heart to see the, the schools in our community thrive um, then anyone who has a heart for that can play ball and so we've tried to really have a centered set mentality as we've set up these different initiatives around the different Denver metro area and then in different parts uh, different communities around the world. Love it. So many things to take away there. Um, and like I said, I, I truly was um, a little apprehensive at first. And, and we're like, you know, Linda is from a, a faith based community. And so working with her, and she was so open and willing, and we're like, okay, how do we reform this and take the religious piece out? Right? Yeah. But then we're like, as we went through the, the book and the content together, and, and no, just lots of light bulbs went on, like, we don't have to, like, that's not the point. The point is, um, we're here to, like you said, make Denver a better uh, community. So how do we do that? So great. Yeah. Well, have you, um, I mean, Deanna, have you had some, have you had any, like you said, you're a little bit apprehensive about working mm -hmm. with faith leaders. Have you had some like weird stuff happen in the past with you that, that like <laughs> created that apprehension? <laughs> I just think we come from that general rule of you never talk about, you know, religion and politics. <laughs> so. Right. Yeah, I get it. Um, I, and I understand, I totally understand why. Yeah. So I, like I said, but my, you know, lots of light bulbs kept going on as I was reading the book and I, and I'm like, hang on, why can't we do this? Like, uh, you know, I think your Denver example is, is amazing to see everyone come together and just work for that kind of bigger common good. Sure. Yeah. Let's, um, let's talk a little bit about, you know, in here, you have a very simple formula for neighboring. Um, and again, like once you broke it down, I was like, well, yeah. <laughs> um, <laughs> So can you outline that for our, for our audience? Just simple, simple formula. Yeah. Well, we had an incredible municipal leader who really helped us think through a lot of this. And her name is Vicki Ryer. She was our assistant city manager. And she, somewhere along the line, she just drank the neighboring Kool-Aid. You know, she just started to realize <laughs> like this matters. And she was so focused on this and was just, you know, raising up neighboring as a value in our city for a long time. And so she was a huge, huge gift for us as we kind of walked down this road and started dreaming about, you know, how would you start a neighboring movement in a, in a community of 130,000 people? And 
one of the things that we fell into first, and this this was the secret sauce for us. This is a little, looks like a tic-tac-toe mm -hmm. board. Um, and this is actually a refrigerator magnet. And this ended up being, this ended up being the most important. So the book's fine. Uh, the book's got good, some good thoughts and tools and stuff, but this is a hundred times better than the book. So this little simple tool right here, uh, and I'm sure our publisher would hate me saying this. Uh, <laughs> so this, this little 30 cent magnet uh, for us is where we saw so much traction. And what this is, so we stood up in, in everywhere that we had a voice. So the city did this and they mailed them out to every single household uh, in, in our community of 130,000. Every single faith community that was a part of this uh, stood up front and just said, you know, we want to encourage you. And, and how I did it, you know, from a faith lens and whether you're an imam or a rabbi or, you know, a pastor or a priest, you know, the, the thought was the same as like, hey, if you really take your faith seriously and believe in the idea of loving your neighbor, it might be helpful to know your neighbor's names. And so like that, that was a big aha moment for us. Like if you're going to love your neighbor, knowing their names might be a good idea. And we just did this little quiz. In fact, I'll just do it with everybody who's, who's listening on the, the webinar. You know, if you just kind of think about a tic-tac-toe board, if you just think about walking out the front door of your townhouse or your condo or your home, think about walking out that front door and think about like the eight closest units to you okay so it doesn't have to look like a tic tac you know you don't take this literally but if you think about those eight closest units to you when we did this all across our city in every environment we could we just we called it a, a pop you know a quiz or a test we just said right now would you just draw a tic tac toe board and would you just write down as many of the names of the people that live in those eight units as you can and and so that we would sit there and do this over and over and over again. And there was this incredible moment when you do that. And like when I first did this, I could only write down both adults' names in two of the eight households. And I had met them all. I'd met all those mm -hmm. people. But because I wasn't being very intentional, it became, oh, that's the guy with the blue truck and he's got mm -hmm. like the two kids and then his wife drives that car and, you know, and you just have these moments where you meet people every once in a while. And then if you, if you're not intentional about having conversations with them, you forget their names. Mm -hmm. And so for us, we just, we challenge people. Would you be willing to learn and retain and use the names of your neighbors? And, and that we ke I've kept going back to that over and over and over again. And this was a little refrigerator magnet that we just said, Hey, would you put this up on your fridge? And as you learn a new name, will you fill it in? And there was something really profound about putting the people's name. Well, first of all, it's, there's something really powerful about having moments face to face with people. I remember I had to do this with several of my neighbors and walk across the street and go, Hey, listen, I know I've met you multiple times. I actually forgot your name. And there's something, <laughs> there's something sacred in doing that of having a face to face interaction with somebody and, and then to just go and write it down. And that was it. And, and there's all kinds of other stuff we did, Deanna, across our community to build this, but we like, and it was good, but if you can get people to do this, if you can get people to make a commitment to learn and retain and use their names and to give them a tool that keeps people's names visible, mm -hmm. if you just do that, what happens as a result is incredible. And, and some, you know, some of my neighbors, like, they don't really want to be my friend. Like I learned their name, mm -hmm. we had that interaction, but they're super busy and they just, they come home every day and the garage door goes up and then it goes down and they grab their kids and they go off and do some, you know, activity. And then they grab fast food on the way home. Then they come back in and their garage, door, <laughs> then they wake up and do that all over again. And, and so I, I'm not trying to stalk those neighbors. I've just learned <laughs> like, the, like those neighbors, but some of my neighbors, I lean a little bit towards them. And you can tell there's something reciprocal. And those are the neighbors where I find it goes from, hey, bro, or, you know, hey, you know, that whatever awkward thing you use when you don't know somebody's name to, hey, Matt, to, hey, Matt, did you watch the, did you watch the end of that Oilers game the other night? Like, can you, can you believe they lost in, in a shootout or whatever it is, right? Nice to, shout out to the Oilers there, Dave. <laughs> That, that may, I know we have like a worldwide audience that may not, it's the Edmonton Oilers, if you don't know who that is. <laughs> um, so, and then it goes to like, Hey, like, can you help me move this thing in my garage? Just like 10 feet to, Hey, like you're going to be watching the game and we're going to be watching the game. And, you know, and this is a two year window of, of you know, relationships take time. And, uh, and so, 
it's the long game when it comes to really getting to know your neighbors and then somebody moved and you got to learn a new name and go through all that again. But, but this, this was the key. This was the secret sauce to building connective tissue um, because, you know, so much of momentum is just getting started. And I think a lot of what we learned in starting this movement, in our community is, you know, we, we have these ideas, we're going to start this huge neighboring movement. There's going to be block parties. There's going to be all of this different stuff. And, and we, we got lucky. We didn't start off saying, Hey, we want you to like get to know and become best friends with your neighbor. All we said, mm -hmm. we set the bar really low. Um, <laughs> you know, we just said, would you be willing to learn and retain and use your neighbor's names? And we keep going back to that over and over again, because we know what flows out of there. We know that, um, that if you just take that first step in neighboring, so it's like stepping onto a moving sidewalk. You know, you take that first step and with some of your neighbors, it just starts you down this road and you just keep following breadcrumb to breadcrumb. And then you wake up one day, three or four years later and go like, these are my friends. You mm -hmm. know, some of these people have become my friends and my support network. And when you get there, that's, that's when it gets really fun and it gets really messy and it gets really beautiful all at the same time. You know what I loved um, that you shared that um, you were honest and you really only knew like two people or two people's names, right? And oh. so you had to work at this, like. Oh, I think Deanna, like I will just tell you this. It was an awful moment for me personally <laughs> to sit there and listen to our mayor. We're sitting there asking our mayor for like, hey, what, you know, what's the big thing we're gonna go out? You know, the faith community is gonna wipe out homelessness in our city, all the same. And I'm sitting there listening to our mayor and I'm like, Oh my goodness, I've become so busy trying to lead this organization and this, this thing that I'm a part of. And, you know, and I go and I do all of this stuff. And then I sit on three different nonprofit boards and then my kids are all doing this stuff. And that moment where I realized, oh my goodness, I have not, I'm not intentional about just doing small things with the people that live right around me. And we had a couple of friends that we really liked, but there was this mm -hmm. whole ecosystem that was that was right there for the taking and i was sitting around run, you know i was sitting around running from different board meetings and different mm -hmm. like you know different meetings at the church and i hadn't taken the time to just slow down and do small things to build connected tissue in my own neighborhood so yeah it was it was awful to hear my to hear our mayor say like hey the smartest thing you guys can do as a bunch of faith leaders is is start a neighboring movement because i realized <laughs> i'm gonna have to do this in my own life like this is gonna mean like i'm gonna have to and it and it's been a gift. It gave me, um, honestly, gave me an excuse to say no and get off some like nonprofit yeah. boards and, and to be more present in my own front yard. And that's, that's the key. Like, it's really hard to be a good neighbor when you're not in your neighborhood a lot. Mm -hmm. And so, and I, I wasn't living in a way I was, I was running pretty hard and I, this, this gave me an excuse to slow down and it opened up my world into something really, really special right outside my front door. That was, that was 11 years ago that I kind of had that convicting moment with our mayor and what's happened since then and the change that's happened. I live in a little cul-de-sac with 42 other households and what's happened over the last 11 years has been the best thing that I've experienced in my life. Love it. Um, so I think if we think about that, I love the moving sidewalk idea. Um, you know, and you're right, like, so you kind of come out as, as maybe strangers and you're right, like, hey, bro. Um, and then, and then you're on, and then you move to acquaintance where you might know their names. Yeah. And then the third is like building that relationship. So I yeah. love it. Very simple. Strangers it is really, really simple. Yeah. Um, so what are, let's talk a little bit about what are some of the myths to neighboring? Um, mm -hmm. And I know the book does go into this. Uh, so let's talk um, that's some of the common one, right? I don't have time or, um, yeah, let's talk about that. What yeah, did I mean, you I come up with? The two biggest reasons that Pete, when we talk to people and say, hey, how come you're not more engaged with the people that you live closest to? The two things that come up are time or fear. Those are the two biggest hurdles that people have to get over. And, and the fear thing is, I, I think a lot of it comes from, we are exposed to so much. And so much of what we're exposed to is really dark. Like if you just look on the, if, if you're sitting there, we, this 24 hour news cycle, it mm -hmm. lives on things that like are, are a lot of times just awful. And, yeah. and when you're exposed to, you know, somebody, 
there, there was just a shooting yesterday in Brooklyn yeah. where uh, somebody walked into a subway station. And did, when you're exposed to stories like that over and over and over again, it does something to our subconscious. And all of a sudden, that person moves in next door. And I'll give you an example. There's a person who was really shy that moved close to us who um, was single and didn't have any kids. And, and he was really introverted. And I found myself like going, oh, man. That, you know, I just found myself making these assumptions yeah. that were kind of out of my own laziness because I didn't get to know this person. And, and it's really easy to do it. And here's the hard thing, Deanna, is there's a lot of dark stuff out. I mean, I, I'm not, you know, sometimes you might have somebody that lives next to you that isn't safe or, I, you know, but it's, that happens way less often than we like yeah. to think. And so for me, it was just leaning in, getting to know somebody's name. You need to know a little bit about their story, asking a few questions about, hey, where do you move from? And, you know, what do you do for work? And all of those things kind of just started to take away some of these assumptions that I was making. And I just realized, oh, this guy is just an introvert. <laughs> and, you know, like instead of instead of thinking, you know, ah, who knows what's going on behind that door? And and so I think that fear piece that we have a lot of times, I, I do I do think we need to be discerning. I do think we need to, to make good decisions and to be safe and those kind of things. But I think it's important for us to take a step back and go, am I letting other things mm -hmm. create fear? And am I making assumptions about the people who live around me instead of actually taking the time to, to get to know them? Um, and so that the fear one is a big one. And then the biggest one is time. Mm -hmm. You know, we, we live in a way, um, it, it's ironic. We have more time-saving devices and technology <laughs> than any other people group in the history of the world. And yet we have the least no amount time. of margin. Yeah. <laughs> no time. <laughs> and that's, that's insane. I mean, that's like we, that we just have one of the myths that I think we, that we bought into is, you know, everybody lives like this and yeah, it's crazy and hectic. And I feel <laughs> like I'm just like running from one thing to the next, to the next. But um, for me in my life, that was the biggest barrier was just, am I going to take the time to like leave my phone inside my house and just hang out in my front yard and see what happens. I and think am I that goes actually... to what's that? Yeah, you you mentioned intentional earlier, and like I think you yeah. made it very intentional and you took that time. So I think intentional just, really just plays... being visible, just yeah. being visible is massive. That's why we saw such a one of the silver linings from COVID has been, um, especially early on when people were not going to work, they were not at school, they were not you know all of a sudden. In my neighborhood, I started seeing people way more often. People were like stir crazy inside there. So they're taking walks and they're out there. And I think that was one of the that was one of the silver linings of COVID is that a lot of our neighbors were more visible than they had been in the past. And I think we're we're at a moment here, there's a crossroads for us to capitalize on some of that visibility that happened and to not retreat back into some of our old uh, patterns of yeah. just being way too busy and not having enough margin or just being inside of our house. And so I think, I think culturally, wherever we are, there's, there's a great opportunity to continue to build on some of those things. A lot of my neighbors were so like just cooped up uh, that we started doing social distance. We, we would just bring lawn chairs and especially early on, and we were hanging out, you know, socially distanced out in the front yard, in the driveways. And it was so incredible just to be able to connect with people face to face <laughs> and to be able just to catch up so um and i i've talked about this a lot i everywhere i go i hear people saying yeah i saw my neighbors more um i hope that doesn't go away as things you know go back to mm -hmm. the old the old normal yeah i think it was really cool in our neighborhood we saw like um for halloween and it's continued now every halloween like we're just having um we're sitting at the front of our driveways and then all of the neighbors are visiting while we're handing out our treats. But that was a, that was from COVID, right? Instead of hiding in your yeah. door and just handing, <laughs> um, yeah. it brought us out, even though it's can be quite cold. Um, oh, yeah. I love that. I mean, and that's uh, things like that. It's small things that make a big difference in neighboring. You know, I always say you get disproportionate results. You do something small <laughs> and it, it's all of a sudden, oh my goodness, I know that person's name now, or I learned a little bit more about their story. Or I, their kids were able to like meet my kids at that, you know, at that time because we sat out front during Halloween. Mm -hmm. So um, it, that's the great news when it comes to neighboring is like that the small things make a big difference. 
Yeah, I think we've talked, um, you know, so the myths, you know, the fear, uh, perceived fear, the time factor. Um, and then, you know, I think we kind of probably everyone on the call knows, like, what happens if we let fear and time get in the way? Um, you know, that's where we're seeing isolation, loneliness, um, fear. And then you even mentioned, like, even the misunderstandings or the assumptions that weren't true. Yeah. Yeah. yeah I had one of my neighbors, um, one of my neighbors, my direct neighbor um they're first generation and they came over from laos um and moved here to Denver, you know 20 plus years ago and most of the people that they hung out with were all other people from either cambodia or laos or, or vietnam they just had built a, a community and a culture here in our in the denver metro area and i for for a couple of years like i just made it sound i'm like wow they seem like they have like cool parties and like they probably don't ever like it just seems like I, I probably, they've got their own thing going on. It's kind of what I told myself in my mind. And they were, I, I, we've become friends now. And what I learned is he used to look at us and he's like, these, you know, these like white, you know, <laughs> people, they don't, they don't want to hang out with us. And so we were both making these assumptions. And what brought us together was some, some we had like the wind blew down our fence and I started talking to him more and we, and I started asking him, about his story, we ended up, my, my kids, I was like, hey, you guys always have incredible, I can smell whatever you're cooking over there. And I don't know what it is. It's something that I've never had before. And if you, if there's ever an opportunity to have our kids and us come over and have a meal, like I actually invited myself to his home to have a meal, to have like, you know, and that broke the ice. They came over and my kids are eating all of this food and they've never had it before. They're asking all these questions. And then all of a sudden we started asking them about like, Tell us about how you ended up here. And there's this uh, beautiful, incredible story about how they ended up in the United States. And my kids got to hear it. And that, that one little thing just created this incredible soil. And Pet and Home are their names. And they've just been, become incredible friends to us. Um, but the assumptions that we were making early on had prevented us from having any kind of interaction. Um, and it was going both ways. And so looking for ways to break down some of those walls is really key. I love that. You just invite yourself over. It's awesome. <laughs> <laughs> I'd invite them um, over to our house for food, but it would be an awful experience for them. <laughs> <laughs> um, so as municipal staff um, and organizations, you know, we're always trying to like seek funding and we need to seek evidence to support our work. Um, so based on your research and kind of, you know, this book has been out for about 10 years now. Um, have you seen evidence that neighboring does support health and well-being? Yeah. Other than we know that, we know it in our hearts. Um, but have you seen evidence? Exactly. Yeah, and there's some good stuff around out there. Robert Putnam uh, wrote a book called Bowling Alone that goes into some of the stuff around how crime is impacted by people. His stat was around in neighborhoods where people know the names of their actual neighbors. Uh, mm -hmm. I think that he had, and that he worked with some researchers on was crimes 82% less. Because obviously, if you see something that if you know the people and you see something that's not right, you don't hesitate to text or to call and just say, hey, listen, there was a moving truck outside of your house today. Is something going on that I don't know about? <laughs> or, you know, any or you just kind of are looking out for one another. And so there's some good stuff out there on crime. Um, in the beginning of Malcolm Gladwell's book, Outliers, the intro to that book, he and, and there's some great data that he points everyone to, but he talks about this little Italian community in Pennsylvania whose health, you know, the people, the, the sociologists couldn't figure out why are these people living so much longer than others? Mm -hmm. um, and he just breaks this whole thing down and they go through every iteration of trying to figure out what is the common denominator, what's going on in this little community. I think it's called Rosetto. And it was all Italian immigrants. And what had happened is they had moved here. They were just deeply, deeply connected to one another. So he, he does some great research around the health benefits of actually knowing your neighbors. Um, I'm not a sociologist. And so I can just tell you what we noticed here in our community. And one of, one of the odd things that we started tracking was uh, calls to code enforcement. And so what we were told, what Vicki Ryer, our assistant city manager, told us at the beginning was, if this works, if you start a movement where people learn names and, and are part of good block parties, um, we should we will see a dip in the number of calls to code enforcement because instead of picking up the phone and complaining mm -hmm. about the person's um, broken window, they actually start checking on each other relationally. And so, and that, and, and 
our area in Denver, it's a lot of that is based on snowfall. And so I don't want to misrepresent statistics or do anything like mm -hmm. that um, because it is hard. There's multiple factors going on with code enforcement calls, but our city and our uh, police department, our code enforcement team, two years in, really, Dave, we have seen these drop off a cliff and we're watching this over and over again. And so we were able, by connecting neighbors, we were able to take a burden off of the code enforcement and a lot of our civic leaders in our city. And I would, I would suggest that if you do this and you do it well and you're able to get traction on it, um, that you'll see the same in your community as well because those relational connections um, begin to take a burden off a lot of the things that municipal leaders are trying, the, the initiatives, the things that uh, or municipal leaders are trying to uh, tackle. Quick question. Um, have you seen, is there a difference between rural and urban? Big time. It, well, in the real difference, the yeah, is multi-unit housing and uh, traditional kind of like suburban individual um, houses. In in apartments or townhomes or anything like that, if you're if you're listening, you probably already know this. The the great thing about that is you have common space. Oftentimes there's a lobby, there's a, a courtyard, there's a pool, there's some, you know, so you've got common space to bring people together, which is, which is, can be leveraged in really cool ways. The hardest thing you would think that because the density is higher in apartments or multi, multi unit housing, that it would be easier to get people to make connections. But most people that live in those end up coming back and saying, I just want to get inside my I just want to get inside my cage. Like I just need to get inside my <laughs> space. I'm tired. I just want to get there. And then you've got issues with sh with sound because of shared walls. Um, and then you've got issues because you're more transient in apartments and townhomes than you are in single family homes. And so there, there's pros and cons on that side. Um, single family homes, you have these, a lot of times you've got these privacy fences. The, the mm -hmm. homes are geared towards the backyard. And so the front, one of the best yeah. things you can do if you just want to take a baby step towards the neighbor, just stop hanging out in your backyard. Hang out in your, look for a way. I, my wife and I bought our house because we loved our backyard. And then this whole awakening thing happened to us. We never use our backyard anymore because we're, we try to be visible. Um, just being visible allows, uh, allows the common everyday interactions to happen. And I think those make a big difference over time. Wow. Uh, so next steps as we're, Coming up to 1143. I'm looking at Lily just through on here that she planted a vegetable garden oh. in her front yard. So, and I mean that, just doing things like that. You know, we we play spike ball a lot and have a hammock and, and we put all that stuff out in the front yard now, but just doing those small things. Uh, all right, that's the key. Love it. I see there's lots of good resources popping into the chat there, the turquoise table. I've seen that one. Yeah, Kristen's um, great. Kristen Shell's great with the turquoise table. So what do you think, could you summarize some of the, the next steps for us on the call today? Um, what are some things we could do? What are some little actions we could take away from today and do? Yeah, I mean, I would just say, if you're leading an organization, if you're a municipal leader or a faith leader, but, you know, if you're thinking about this stuff, you should do it in your own life. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's like the, that's the biggest key. I, it's so easy for us to get so busy trying to start these things that we forget that we're actually supposed to live this stuff out in our own lives. And what we've learned is that when people live this out in their own lives, they can't shut up about it. They like, <laughs> they can't, they, you know, they're like Vicky, they drink the Kool-Aid and, or they're like oh, what I am. And like, I, I can't go back. You know, for me, this has been a different way of living. It's been, for me, it's been like having kids. Like, I don't know what your kids are like. If you have kids that are, my kids are hard. Um, and, and I don't ever want to go back. And that's how I feel about neighboring. <laughs> like, you know, like it, it's hard sometimes. Um, but what I've experienced in my own life, the ways that it's made me slow down and to, to walk my neighborhood. And it, like I've rediscovered a, a theology of place that I never had before. And, and for me, that gift alone um, has just been a, been a really, really big deal. And so just learning people's name, you know, taking the next steps. One, do you know the names of the people that you live around? Mm -hmm. uh, a lot of you know John McKnight 
and I love John. He's and he became a friend through a lot of this. He got really intrigued. Uh, John wrote the Green Book, the uh, asset based media development um, Green Book. But I remember him. I gave him the quiz. I gave him the quiz once. <laughs> the, one of the first times I met him, and he was like, "Don't do this to me." And he's like. <laughs> <laughs> and so for all of us, it, it was so encouraging. I, John's, the, he's the best. He has such a credible spirit. But like, for you know, John and I are writing books around this stuff. And it's important for us to take a step back and realize like, am I living this out in my own life? Am I, am I really doing these things that I say make such a big difference? Does that be my encouragement to everybody is to like, grab a nap. My, I didn't have a, a cool refrigerator magnet when I first did this. I had a napkin and I stuck it on my fridge and it worked just fine. Um, but just do something visible that helps you retain the names and then use their names when you see them and then just sit back and watch what happens. So that'd be the first thing I'd encourage people to do. Um, and then to encourage other, you know, I would encourage you to set the bar low with the people you're leading. Um, you know, my, my whole life, people just told me good leaders always set the bar high. And that's probably true. Mm -hmm. You know, when you're building, uh, when you've got a staff meeting or when you're, you're building a team, an organization, like setting the bar high is great. People either come close to the bar, they'll come over it, and you'll be able to accomplish some things as a small group of people. But what I learned through this is if you want to start a movement, if you want to like, if you want to do something that can really easily scale, the key isn't to set the bar high. The key is to set the bar so low that people can't crawl underneath it. Um, and so for us, like I would just encourage you to think of think of very practical next steps um, that are low bar things that you're inviting people to do. Um, that would be my best advice for, for those of you that are out there thinking about how to start neighboring movements in your own communities. Yeah, I could, I agree. I, I think um, keep it simple and keep it small. Like I said, we started out and we thought we had to have all these resources and guides and, and kind of everything ready. Yeah. Uh, but we've really learned you just like take a step back and keep it simple. Keep it small. Yeah. Like and that. it just, your magnet. I love that. Just keep taking the next small step mm -hmm. and the next small step. And I think if, if you, and identify it, I mean, I think there's a lot of great research out there on um, how do we form habits and how do behaviors, you know, grow. Mm -hmm. And, you know, the, the book, The Power of Habit was just how do we identify small next steps and then share with others like, hey, here's my goal. Like, hey, that one family, I said we were going to have them over a year ago and we still haven't had them over. Like, I'm going to walk across the street and say, hey, like, let's actually get together this weekend. Are you guys available? And so just continuing to take those next small steps is, is really important. Yeah, I would encourage um, people on the call, like read the book. There are, there's so many examples in there of su success stories. Um, and I guess, you know, uh, one of the lines again that I love, um, you know, neighboring is a journey. Um, it doesn't end and it's not yeah. a project. And so I totally agree with you, Dave. Like I, I kind of had that, look at it too because uh, I live in a community um, where I don't work and so I'm like well that kind of goes against everything that I'm trying to do at work so <laughs> yeah. um, how do I get to know my neighborhood um, yeah. yeah so it's really it's not a project uh, it really is it's more of a journey um, yeah and our book may make sense I mean we wrote our book to people kind of in our face stream of just saying hey like we just said listen just says you, you should love your neighbor do you even know your neighbor's names but if you're not into that then there's all kinds of other great reasons. Uh, McKnight yeah. and Peter Block wrote a book called Community. I mean, there's there's so much good stuff right now out there. There's kind of this wave of literal neighboring that is, you know, a lot of writing and thinking and thought leaders on this. And so there's no shortage of content. If our stuff doesn't make sense for your contact, your, our context, just find something else that's good. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I was, Heather, um, I'm sure Heather and, and you and you can provide plenty of those resources. I'm gonna, and I'm what, gonna you're, what you're doing, what you're, I mean, this is, this is what I love about your institute and what you're up to. Uh, you guys are doing so much great work and compiling so many great resources in this area. And I'm going to jump in here because uh, most of the questions that we've got, you've answered um, through this conversation. So I just feel like we're really in tune uh, with what what uh, people are wanting to know. Um, and just just to go to what you said, Dave, uh, John McKnight, when you've seen one community, you've only seen one community. And so mm -hmm. as we are doing these programs and initiatives, and there's some great stuff coming up in the chat box, um, you have to figure out what works for your community. And, you know, it's not a cookie cutter. And so, you know, getting to know the names and the feel and understanding of communities, um, it, it may not work in all communities, but, you know, something might work in yours. And so I find that the comments and the ideas and suggestions, I call those sparks. 
Um, and it, you know, it might spark a fire in your community to really get going, or it might just be a spark um, for you to try something else. So, um, so we do have some and, questions. And I know, oh, can I say one thing, Heather? I yeah. know you guys have had Howard Lawrence on here yes. and some of the stuff he's done. Like, he, like I'm doing, I'm doing like asset based community for dummies. Okay. Like I'm doing, <laughs> <laughs> What Howard and some of these other people are, I love it. They're, they're taking, it's like graduate level and AP level yes. um, neighboring. And so um, I just want to encourage people to look into the work that, uh, that you've been pointing people toward, and especially Howard specifically. Yeah. And I, and I really think it's not, we're not building a rocket, right? It's not rocket science. Yeah. Uh, neighboring is something that is so fundamental and we are born with. Humans are mm -hmm. born to connect. And so let's try, let's, let's not make it academic and, and rocket science. Let's keep it simple. And I think that that's mm -hmm. what we need to do to be able to create this, this movement. Um, so I, I'm gonna go, there was a question here and Brenda was the first one to put it in here and I love her question. Can you suggest one thing that you would recommend to engage one neighbor, one's neighbor? Yeah, I, well, I'm going to throw it up to both of you because I think, yeah, you've got some good examples. So too. One thing to engage one neighbor. An idea, like how, you know, when I'm going to say, so one thing that I, I saw, which was absolutely brilliant, was a community plate. Um, mm -hmm. And it said our community and it was cookies. And they went over to their neighbor. This is in St. Albert. They went over to their neighbor and they gave them cookies. And then that neighbor said, wait a second, this is our community. They made something and gave it to the next neighbor. And then that's how they engaged one neighbor. Love it. That's good. I like that. I mean, I, I'll just, I mean, the first thing that comes to mind, like my, I, one of my neighbors has a lawn that looks like it's from off of a golf course. I mean, it, it is like immaculate and mine does not look like that at all. <laughs> and I just asked him when I was just like, Hey, okay, we live right next to each other. Help me understand what you're doing over here because mine. And I mean, I just asked a simple question about like, what do you do with your lawn? And he just lit up and he just started to share all, I mean, he's like, okay, listen, you're in January, you do this. I mean, he, it's just, he gave me like a 10 minute sermon from January to December of what he did when he got done. And I just sat there the whole time. I didn't say that what, what I was thinking, when he got done, I, what I was thinking was this totally isn't worth it. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but I didn't, but I did not say that. What I said was, I was like, wow, thank you so much for sharing. This is fascinating. But there was just something in the research, like he has some knowledge and a passion that mm -hmm. I that I didn't have. And there was just something beautiful of just asking a simple question and just seeing him come alive. And that's the asset-based thought around this is when you just, you know, you're able to see somebody who's got a gift. Um, I haven't done anything about it. My yard still looks the same. His, his still looks the same. But just just being curious with people, mm -hmm. just noticing something that you could, I can tell he takes a lot of pride, spends a lot of time and does an incredible job with his yard. And so just asking something that simple was, was something that I learned a lot about him. And there was a connection there that even though I don't have that same interest, there was a, I learned about his story. He appreciated that I asked. And that was just something really simple that made a big difference with one of our, one of my neighbors. Mm. My, uh, my family teases me because I'm like this, the Snoopy neighbor, right? Like I'm always watching. And so I'm curious and I'm watching and I'm like, oh, okay. Like they're, so they have motorbikes and we think they're really loud, but they also have a dog. So it's finding that like common interest. Like you said, maybe you're not crazy about lawns, but yeah, that was something you thought you could chat with him about. Um, and so I, yeah, ours, you know, so the people with the motorbike, oh, they're kind of annoying. Like the bikes are so loud and they rev them up on Saturday mornings. Um, but we ventured down there and asked them about their, their dog that they put on their bike with his little doggles. Like, and so it was something to, to find co in common with them and chat and then learn more. So I, that, that's kind of what I have found over in my neighborhood is the one thing to do is just kind of be curious and observant, I guess, um, and see what you can find. Um, yeah. to make I, and I would suggest, about. <laughs> I would suggest we all have in, in our neighborhoods, there's all time, there's all kinds of tension and. Um, so yeah, you mentioned your neighbors with a lot of motorbikes. Like, I think one of the best things you can do is be curious with those people and they're mm -hmm. the hardest. Cause you just, there's, if you're, if you just kind of left to your own advice, you're like, you know what, I'm just not going to engage. Like they're, they're obnoxious or they're annoying or whatever, but like, those are the people, if you can lean towards them a little bit, it's, it's am amazing what happens. If you learn somebody's story a little bit, 
a lot of the things that annoy you about them tend to fade away. Um, not always. Assumptions, right? Like yeah. your first assumption. Um, yeah. And then, yeah. yeah. And I just think we need to learn how to be peacemakers in our neighborhood. There's so much BS and like polarization going on out in our world. Like I think as we learn to be peacemakers, great things happen. And, you know, for us and for me, it's just been a gift. The, the beauty for me of the neighboring stuff is it just guarantees that you're going to be connecting with people who think about the world differently than you do. And mm -hmm. the proximity can create the common thread for, uh, I've got, I've got friends who just think politically totally opposite of mm -hmm. me and they, and, and they become friends to me because we live next to each other. And I'm not trying to convince them to like, think mm -hmm. like I do. And they're not trying to do it either. And there's just something that's what we need more of. That's how we're going to battle the polarization that exists. And I mean, I, there was this incredible picture during the last election, like, uh, I think USA Today ran it. It was just two families and they both had one had their like Trump signs out and one had their Biden signs out. And then in the middle, it says, it, you know, it says, and we still love each other. Somebody oh, put, awesome. had put a sign in the middle and I'm like, <laughs> yes, that is what, that's what we need. That, that's what we need. Yeah. Actually, I could do without the Trump and Biden signs too. Uh, but in <laughs> <laughs> And, and that's actually, that's maybe one of the challenges and next steps to, to the folks on the call is, you know, find that neighbor that just really bothers you or you don't like and challenge you to find something that can connect yes. the two of you. Because I always, and I say this to my boys, there's two sides to a story. Yeah. Um, and so you, you need to find the two sides before you make an, a, ju a judgment and understanding. And so I think that is part of um, making good neighbors. Uh, we do I, have I agree, Heather. And I just want to say like, just taking time, that, that neighbor that you've had issues with because their dogs are loud or whatever, like just being the kind of person that can walk and go, Hey, listen, like, I know we've had a bunch of stuff in the past. Like, I'd love to have a clean slate. Like that neighbor that you haven't talked to in two years. Cause it's something like just being that kind of a person can make all the difference in our neighborhood. So I just encourage people to think about doing that. Yeah. So we have some other questions here. So what I'll do is we'll um, I call harvesting um, the questions and I'll send them out to the two of you to see um, if you have any um, thoughts or ideas because we are running out of time and I know we, we end promptly for everybody, but I have, I have harvested some tips here. So, um, you know, hidden agendas is how mm -hmm. things go weird. Mm -hmm. um, don't overpromise. Uh, step onto the moving sidewalk. Yeah. Um, be present in your own front yard. And I wrote, walk the talk. Mm -hmm. um, uh, being okay with not being friends, but being friendly. So yes. we're not out yeah. there to make a thousand friends. It's being friendly. Um, uh, create, and you talked about, like, this is my, my official term for it, bumping places. Um, so create bumping places so in in apartment buildings th those areas the lobby areas are so underutilized if you yes. don't have a common room right so create these bumping places and and common places for people to get together and then my favorite is set the bar low so people have to walk over it <laughs> <laughs> i love it i so, love it good job thank you deanna thank you dave thanks thank you so fun. much mm -hmm.